Hello everyone and welcome to today's National Rural Health Alliance webinar. Today's topic is rural and remote areas and the refocusing of Commonwealth mental health services. We are pleased to welcome our presenters for today, Ian Hickey, Frank Quinlan and Russell Roberts. This webinar is live and interactive. You are encouraged to participate by posing questions to the presenters which can be typed into the chat box located at the bottom left hand corner of your screen. If you're experiencing difficulty hearing the sound during the webinar, please dial the 1-800 support number provided in the chat box. I'd now like to pass you over to Ian to begin. Uh, welcome and uh, thanks everyone for taking the time to interact with this webinar. One of my key roles is as one of Australia's National Mental Health Commissioners since the Commission was established in 2012. And at the request of the Abbott Government, we did a review of Commonwealth Services, which was delivered uh, 12 months ago to the Federal Government. And we saw the response uh, just last month from the Prime Minister and the Minister, Minister Lee, of the Commonwealth's response to services. So this is an incredibly important time in thinking about how mental health and related services can be delivered in Australia. Throughout that whole process, there was a very large emphasis on how this might work in rural and regional Australia in particular. And I think it's most, one of the most interesting things that I've ever been involved in. I think there's a tremendous amount of implied structural reform which really puts an emphasis on local governance. You know, what really works in the 55 socioeconomic and geographical regions of Australia? So getting out of, finally, I hope, a lot of the useless Commonwealth state dialogue about funding and service provision into how to Commonwealth, state, private, NGO services come together in a more organised way to meet demand at the local and regional level. Obviously, the Commonwealth is going to use primary health networks as its principal funding mechanism for the distribution of the funds. So the Commonwealth is talking about transferring a large amount of its current program money under PHN control from 2016 onwards, progressively, in the youth mental health area and the ongoing clinical care issues that it has responsibility for. Also, in related areas of suicide prevention. That's an enormous opportunity, but it's also an enormous challenge as to what are we really trying to achieve and what might be the opportunities in organising our services and our structures differently in a number of particular ways. And I want to emphasise just in my presentation some of the issues from the report for some of the key themes. And I've used the mental wealth of Australia as the issue. You will hear the Prime Minister repeatedly refer to the mental wealth of nations and the mental wealth of Australia. And in his presentation around the release of the report, he said our greatest attributes are not below the ground to be dug up and exported. They're actually in the minds and bodies of the people who live in Australia. We need to be innovative and think about our mental capital. We need to think about the use of things like new technologies to assist in deriving new services. Now, the origin of that sort of thinking about mental wealth, and I think it's a great expression, it's all about social and economic participation. The reason we do all this is that people can live better, more productive lives. It's not simply an illness prevention or treatment kind of approach. The origin of that kind of thinking in a written kind of way is actually in this uh, report, which is a summary in the journal Nature in October 2008, around actually focusing on mental wealth, that, that all countries got to learn to capitalise on their citizens' cognitive resources to prosper, and it's prosper or thrive economically and socially. And actually within that issue, or, orientating services towards earlier intervention and then continuing support at all stages of life, not just in childhood or adolescence, is the key to that. And if you have the opportunity, I suggest getting a hold of that three-page article and looking at the lifestyle, a uh, life course approach intrinsic in that. But also, whatever we do, well, it's not simply about increasing activity, which is what health systems and welfare systems traditionally do. It's about leading to better lives. And rather than specifying what you do, what we'd really like to see, and this is certainly a National Commission perspective, is does it deliver a better outcome? Does it actually work for the people affected? And the solutions in various aspects of rural and regional Australia will not be the same as in other aspects of urban Australia. There are different communities, there are different characteristics, there are different sets of issues where you need to have an understanding of the local framework in, and local governance of that to get the best solution. I've got to say, it doesn't mean only using the existing local resources. I think when people talk about local areas, they think, oh, that just means we need to be to better organise what we've already got. One of these things is, in fact, to use a bit of economic language, courtesy of Alan Fells, is to sort of talk about creating new markets. The PHNs will be purchasing, hopefully in partnership with the state local health districts, 
new frameworks of services. And this may lead to new providers developing and providers with capacity moving into particular areas under these new funding streams. So this is not just about rearranging the existing services and the local contracting arrangements. It should lead to a new breadth of services with greater emphasis on housing, social support, greater use of technology, more multidisciplinary teams, better links with community services with the goal of delivering a better outcome for those who are affected. So if we go back to the Commission report, we did deliver that as requested to the government in November 2014. In terms of its key recommendations, it said, look, all of our systems, and you can see the common language here with the National Disability Insurance System, needs to move from being provider-centric, what do doctors want, what do psychologists want, what do local health districts want, what does New South Wales or Big Health want, to actually being what does the person and their family at the set of this actually need. And that, in a sense, builds on the philosophy behind the National Disability Insurance Scheme, and I think where all these sort of health and welfare systems will go in the future. To achieve that, we need a new system architecture, which is this regionally controlled and potentially pooling of funding and effort at the local level, local governance in those particular issues, and intrinsically a shift towards more efficient and effective upstream services and supports. They're consistent with the first slide I showed, there needs to be a greater emphasis on early intervention in order to maximise your educational, employment, social participation opportunities, and not a late intervention service, which intrinsically many of our mental health services are for people who've already lost contact with education, employment, family, social supports. Uh, consistent with the general view of disorders, the, the report talks about there are different sets of needs. It's great to hear Minister Lee, I think, for a change, the first minister I've heard, actually use the term stepped care in the appropriate way, which is people have different levels of needs, and therefore when they present to care, they should immediately, immediately receive different levels of intervention. Often step care means you must go through some primary care generic thing first and then if you fail that you do something else and then if you finally are worse off and after a long period of time when you're very unwell, then you'll get a more intensive multidisciplinary service. As distinct from identifying right up front, there are differential needs. People are not the same. So you can't have a one-size-fits-all model. For example, the better access model currently Psychological services is a one-size-fits-all. You get six or ten sessions of psychological therapy. Many of our GP and professional psychiatrist services are one-size-fits-all models. They don't encourage complex care. They don't encourage team care. They don't actually change the nature of service provision to meet the person's need. And that that 65,000 that are up the severe end have a certain set of needs, high psychosocial disability needs, overlapping with the National Disability Insurance Area, the really big bit in the middle, the 625,000 with significant mental health problems are the group probably at the moment who get the worst deal but have significant disability and high costs. And a lot of the other issues with more mild, moderate depression, etc. big emphasis, a lot of that care could be delivered in more efficient ways using e-health type services, new technologies and more accessible but also more affordable forms of care than they're currently receiving. So there's an attempt to think about the system architecture in relation to actually people's needs not in terms of provider needs or what simply providers do, and that being reimbursed under our MBS or other sets of systems. So you end up in that situation again with, a, with just a notion of those with high, the high or very high needs and different sets of needs and where they might be in the population basis. So there's got to be some rational thinking about allocation of need relevant to the epidemiology of these situations. What the report highlighted is the Commonwealth already spends almost $10 billion on mental health. There's a lot of discussion about we need more money. We may need more money for certain kinds of services, and that may well be true, but we spend a lot of money, and the great majority we spend at the moment, we spend in the welfare type arrangements. So we spend on welfare and support. And the issue is to say to the Commonwealth, you need to think about the whole of your health and welfare spending. That's the $10 billion in the Commonwealth systems. Depending on how you count it, there's 20 or $30 billion in the state systems also at play here. One of the things we've got to do is think about how the total expenditure in health and welfare could be looked at more efficiently, rather than simply arguing for more money into existing systems. So it's a strong kind of theme back. Um, we did highlight during the report that most of our expenditure is in the welfare area and the hospital types areas and acute care. I think many people, including the original government commentary, misreported that what the Commission was saying was take money out of hospitals and stick it in the community. What the, community, what the, the 
report was saying is over time, the Commonwealth in particular should invest more in upstream and community-based resources rather than in institutional and welfare-based resources as if it's going to shape, change the shape of the cost curve. It wasn't actually talking about taking money out of hospitals or acute care. It was talking about a billion dollars over five years, which was only $200 million a year of that $10 billion a year. So it's actually a fairly small change that was being talked about, but unfortunately it's something of a distraction, I think, from the key issue, which is actually we need to invest in the community if we're going to get an earlier intervention and a continuing participation focus. So over time, if you did that well, you would spend less money over time in the acute hospital sector and you would have greater investment and you'd also spend less time in welfare and then by doing that you'd have more money to spend particularly in the primary care, community services, child and adolescent area. In the sense, you know, that is a philosophical positioning and that really the place to do that is from the Commonwealth's point of view by using its primary health networks from a state point of view, lining those up and coordinating in each state with local health districts or local health networks where the, where the state dollars actually are placed. So just to run fairly quickly now through some of the key recommendations which underpin and, and essentially I'm going back to this because essentially the Commonwealth has accepted in its response the logic of all of this, which is a person-centred approach means the Commonwealth's got to work in partnership, in fact, with local health districts and then you've got to trust the local leadership to be at the heart of it. So, you know, the Commonwealth can take a national role but really it's regional integration and leadership through primary care and, and other networks that is at the heart of this particular issue. We need to think about where we're going in some key areas and particularly adopt a small number of important ambitious targets. Now the Commonwealth hasn't gone for targets per se, but we need to focus on things like suicide reduction. We certainly need to focus on increased participation in employment and education for young people. We need to be clear what we're trying to achieve rather than just increase activity in all of these particular areas. We clearly had recommended this issue about continuing to invest in the community, and while the government hasn't done that directly, it has actually shifted money from existing programs to the tune of 380 million to primary healthcare networks and is entirely open to its cashing out of services in the future to increase expenditure in these areas in programs that work in regional areas that can demonstrate that they can actually deliver in this particular way. Um, the issues about uh, self-care, et cetera, and actually better use of particular better access money is a big issue. And so what's been discussed here subsequently is the potential cashing out of other money that would have otherwise gone in fairly limited provider ways through better access into more multidisciplinary care. So essentially the Commonwealth has taken up that recommendation in a very interesting structural way. For people who may not have got access but to use the equivalent amount of money, Commonwealth money, and that's Medicare money, and that's uncapped money, which if used appropriately could be cashed out to produce more multidisciplinary and relevant services rather than necessarily you have to have a psychologist who gets a certain amount of money. This is really good for the nursing programs, for other professionals, and really pr allows more integrated providers to think about how they might be able to develop better services for those with more significant need. Uh, there's obviously a big issue around children and young people, and we are yet, I think, to really respond significantly to the child framework. We've seen a lot of development in Australia around the youth and young person framework, but the Commission recognises and the government recognises a great deal of work to be done in the children area. Uh, in the future, so that will be a focus. Uh, the, the issues around uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people are a very high priority for the Commission. I think it's fair to say it's a high priority for everybody and seeing enhanced services in that area is for the Commonwealth an area to be further developed and one that we would expect the primary health network to place a great deal of emphasis on. Uh, some people are a bit disappointed that the Commonwealth's response to suicide prevention was not as specific as it might have been. We were recommending specific trials there is, however, both through various state and commonwealth initiatives, a long, a consistent emphasis on regional application of suicide prevention. So I think that concept has been well adopted. We've seen a, a remarkable philanthropic gift in New South Wales by the Ramsey Foundation to back at least four regions in New South Wales to the tune of $15 million be announced uh, last week in this area. So I think this is an area where you will see a very strong emphasis on regional suicide prevention programs involving the whole of the community. There are a lot of workforce challenges in these areas. Uh, we've got to increase our workforce 
and our multi-degree workforce, and more importantly, I think the way that we all work together in these areas to achieve more productive outcomes. Services are important. Service access is important, particularly in rural and regional Australia. And we are world leaders in the use of technologies in these areas. So one of the big ways of increasing access, at least in the first instance, to simple levels of care, simple but effective levels of care, is increased use of technology and increased use of technology for monitoring. Now, clearly, the new Prime Minister is a major advocate of that. And we have amazing capacity in Australia. And the Minister announced there will be a single entry point digitally. You might prefer to use your phone, but you, a lot of people will prefer to come in through new digital devices to enter into and start to receive services. Uh, she is hopeful that would be as early as 2016. I'd be fair to say there's quite a lot of development work to be done on that front to make that work effectively. So we were asking before last week, uh, does the government get it? Because we've been sitting for a long time. Most of the public commentary in this area had been clearly that there's a lot of support. And I, I think in Australia we're lucky. We have a tremendous amount of support. And I personally found the Prime Minister's and the Minister's response incredibly productive. The fact the Prime Minister bothered to actually take the leadership with the Minister on this issue is incredibly encouraging. The mental health framework fits with the rest of what the Commonwealth is designing in healthcare delivery through primary healthcare networks. And not just the politics of it, but the need aspects of it mean that regional and rural Australia are high to very high priorities to get this done. So a lot of the initial effort hopefully builds on what's already been done in regional and rural Australia, but I think prevents present really new structural opportunities uh, in this particular area. So uh, if you look at this with the, the continuous public support in this area, and I would say the support of the key ministers in the government, and importantly the Prime Minister himself, it's a great time for us to get organised, build on the experiences of those who know what they're doing in certain areas, and promote the local governance, and bring to areas new ways, new capacities, through that local governance and local purchasing power to hopefully make a significant improvement. And I'll stop there. So we're going to do a seamless handover to Frank Quinlan. Do you want me to just uh, kick straight off, or is our moderator pushing the button? You're more than welcome to start, Frank. OK, thank you, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, my name's Frank Quinlan from uh, Mental Health Australia. And uh, thanks to the National Rural Health Alliance for getting this opportunity together and, uh, and for the uh, opportunity to speak for a little while this morning. Uh, I, I share many of Ian's uh, views on some of these issues. And I think the um, uh, commission and the commissioners that have been congratulated for um, what they achieved in the preparation of the report. I intend to talk a little bit uh, broadly about some of the other context for the report and the um, sort of environment in which it, it lands in, uh, with a view to really trying to identify uh, where some of those issues will have a particular impact on uh, rural and remote uh, Australia. Uh, it's no surprise to everyone to know that for a very long time, the mental health system has been really problematic. Uh, I came to this work uh, only four or five years ago and found myself frequently saying that uh, we actually don't have a mental health system in Australia. Uh, what we have are a series of uh, programs and services that sometimes connect to each other and sometimes don't. Uh, when they do end up connecting to each other, it's usually because good, committed workers working very hard on the ground actually make things work, uh, not because uh, the uh, systems are in place to support that work. So uh, this, this picture, uh, I think, for me, captured a sense of the sort of hopelessness uh, that is often experienced in relation to mental health reform. It was taken outside. Uh, I took the photo outside the Indigenous Tent Embassy here in Canberra, which is not very far from where I'm uh, sitting now. And there's just the sense, I think, that for a very long time, notwithstanding a few um, sort of short bursts of uh, reform activity and attention, uh, we haven't really achieved the sort of substantial reforms in mental health that uh, many of us would want uh, and hope for. And so I, I really characterise 
what's happening now is, uh, and maybe I'm just being a bit optimistic uh, given it's the end of the year, but I do think we have an opportunity, as Ian said, to sort of shift our, our thinking. Uh, the government have responded with some pretty substantial structural reforms, uh, and I want to talk through those uh, and talk really about how we can maximise the sorts of opportunities uh, as they present themselves and will present themselves over the next few years. Uh, in terms of the sort of, uh, as I described it, the wheels in motion that are underway, as uh, Ian said, the National Mental Health Commission's review of programs and services is certainly a very substantial part of uh, the current reform agenda, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but all of us are also aware that there are a lot of other things uh, happening. Uh, for instance, we have currently the rollout of the National Disability Insurance Scheme and the negotiations of the bilateral agreements between the Commonwealth and State and Territory governments that will underpin that scheme. Now this is important for mental health for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the first and most important reason, I think, is because uh, a lot of the Commonwealth funded mental health programs and services are actually mooted for inclusion in the NDIS. So the um, NDIS agreement, the fundamental agreement between the states and the Commonwealth has agreed that programs like uh, Partners in Recovery, programs like Personal Helpers and Mentors, uh, Mental Health Care or Respite, and a range of other programs that are funded by the Commonwealth are now considered to be in scope for the NDIS. This is a complicated story though because um, when they created the NDIS bucket, uh, the uh, government really had two kinds of contribution. One was a cash contribution whereby they uh, tipped money uh, in, a, in cash into that NDIS bucket and the other was uh, an in-kind contribution which means some of those programs will continue for at least some time as in-kind contributions, meaning that they'll continue to operate but they'll be considered as part of the NDIS. Now we're only going to really see what that means uh, as the bilateral agreements and the operational plans that uh, go with them uh, become public. We've seen those released in New South Wales and in Victoria and now uh, South Australia, uh, but we've not yet seen the operational plans that tell us when certain programs will stop up operating and when uh, the NDIS programs uh, will begin to operate. The other thing that I think is often misunderstood about the National Disability Insurance Scheme is the scale in relation to mental health. So we know that the NDIS makes places for um, something like 480 or 500,000 Australians, I believe, will get uh, what are called uh, tier three um, packages, so intensive individualised packages of support. And we know that something like 60,000 of those people uh, will receive those packages because they have uh, intensive uh, psychosocial needs relating to uh, mental illness. Now we also know that in Australia each year there are something like 600,000 Australians who experience a severe mental illness. So there's obviously a big gap there between what the NDIS will provide and what the ongoing uh, mental health services and programs will need to provide. We're not suggesting for a moment that the uh, uh, all of those uh, people who experience severe mental illness ought be in the NDIS. That, would make no sense. But I think we do need to ensure that there's a reconciliation of who's in and who's out. We, you will have heard a lot of talk possibly about uh, the fact that the uh, tier two of the NDIS, which is the less intensive um, broad based support that will be provided by the NDIS, uh, will uh, fill some of these gaps. But if you saw uh, a couple of months ago the budget information that was provided through the Senate estimates process, you will see that at the full rollout of the scheme across all disability types, across the entire country, uh, when we're rolled out uh, completely in uh, four years time, uh, there will some, be something like only $130 million in grants available to provide tier two support. So if we take the sort of one in five approach, uh, you can see that a very small percentage of that uh, money, possibly 25, 30 million, something like that at best, uh, is likely to be devoted to uh, mental health. So uh, just, just to place that in context, six, the NDIS will provide services to um, 60,000 people who experience severe 
uh, and persistent mental illness and psychosocial uh, disadvantage. And uh, in addition to that, something like 25 million odd dollars uh, of programs that might otherwise provide uh, support. So you can see that there's going to be an important need for systems to exist uh, beyond the National Disability Insurance Scheme. We also have a couple of very important and other uh, reviews underway uh, as we speak at the Commonwealth level. You will have heard that the Commonwealth is reviewing uh, the Medicare uh, items, all of the Medicare items, uh, and you will have heard uh, the pathology and radiology sectors uh, out uh, complaining that the, dis the uh, decisions in the MyEFO seem to preempt uh, some of the decisions that might have been taken by that Medicare review, but nonetheless, uh, there is a review underway and we haven't yet seen uh, where that lands. Uh, we also have uh, Professor Steve Hambleton conducting a review of primary health care. And uh, I think that's a very important review in relation to uh, mental health uh, issues because uh, like the, uh, it, it will be related to the issues around uh, primary health networks. And we'll look at some of the fundamental models and the ways in which we provide primary health care to people who are in uh, particular need. And I think many of the uh, people who don't get places in the National Disability Insurance Scheme uh, will be affected by the results of the primary health care uh, review and what Professor Hamilton uh, recommends. It would seem likely on the face of all that we know that that review is likely to uh, make recommendations about continuing uh, work in uh, uh, primary health networks to provide uh, items around uh, chronic disease management and uh, management of particular conditions. But there are still more wheels in motion that I want to talk about. The Commonwealth and the states and territories are currently at the table negotiating the fifth plan for mental health and suicide uh, prevention. And we saw in the government's response to the Commission's review that uh, they intend in there somewhere, or leave the door open at least in there somewhere, for us to come to this question of indicators and targets, which I'll, uh, I'll come back to later on. Um, at the same time, the government is still uh, undertaking a review of federation with the states and territories. Now, it's fair to say that this was Tony Abbott's um, uh, sort of baby in a way while he was the Prime Minister, so it's a bit harder to see uh, exactly where that will land. But nonetheless, the federation review will also look at uh, the ways in which uh, Commonwealth and states fund uh, health systems. And we saw in the uh, initial health uh, white paper that uh, accommodates, uh, that, or that accompanies that process, that mental health was identified as one of the areas where failed state and territory and Commonwealth uh, collaboration and cooperation was resulting in uh, gaps and duplications, uh, a point that was uh, also identified in the Commission's uh, review. Same time, and Ian talked about the links between mental health programs and welfare programs. And notwithstanding the fact that the National Mental Health Commission identified that much of the Commonwealth spend in the mental health space was in fact spending through the disability support pension and other welfare measures, we've actually seen very little movement from the government other than suggesting in its response that it wants welfare programs more integrated. Uh, we haven't yet seen what that were, is likely to mean on the ground. We haven't yet seen any of that uh, funding shift. Obviously, a very uh, modest impact of a program on a program as big as the disability support pension could have huge implications for uh, mental health programs and services. We've calculated, for instance, that uh, the savings that uh, the government are achieving in relation to entry into the disability support pension uh, through harder entry requirements um, could be something like 250 million or half a billion dollars uh, a year in savings that in our argument should be uh, poured back into mental health services and programs because they're effectively saving. Um, I would also add uh, to, to, the, uh, to the list here a couple of uh, other items. Uh, one is the uh, government's response to the ICE task force which was both a very substantial spend, uh, but also identified explicitly the important links between mental health services and programs and drug and alcohol services and programs. And in particular, uh, talked about uh, rolling, uh, again, nearly a quarter of a billion dollars of spending out through primary health networks. So I think the work that intersects with the uh, ICE task force response is also going to be important. 
as is uh, just a factor that was well hidden in the government's response or, or didn't get much uh, attention. But I think the government's commitment to uh, complete the National Mental Health Service Planning Framework is also a very significant uh, concession from the Commonwealth Government. The National Mental Health Service Planning Framework is a study that's been undertaken for some time but has been uh, buried in the bureaucracy for, uh, uh, for too long now that essentially outlines uh, the demographic needs of the community in relation to mental health services and programs and outlines the available care that's uh, uh, provided through various uh, models and uh, then allow, therefore allows a reconciliation between the care that's provided and the care that's needed. And I think that will give us uh, some important information uh, to benchmark our services in future. I guess I'd just say that, uh, that uh, election readiness is also a question that I think we have to be asking. Um, uh, the current political circumstances in Canberra mean that uh, uh, I think we have to be ready for the fact that there could be an election uh, at, at any time. So this is a little, little picture, just a slide I use sort of, uh, I say to people sometimes that it was taken in my office, it's actually a, a taken from the movie The Perfect Storm. Uh, and uh, the actors are presented with the, uh, with the uh, challenge of the three storms that are colliding at once. And we've had a bit of a sense over the course of the year that that's a pretty good indication of uh, exactly how the mental health sector uh, might be feeling at the moment. Uh, I don't want to dwell on the findings of the National Mental Health Commission's review, though I have the slides here because uh, Ian, I think, has already done an excellent job of uh, outlining those to you. Uh, but did I just want to talk to uh, a, a couple of points in particular. So Ian's talked about redirecting uh, spending and in particular redirecting growth spending. Uh, I want to talk to just this issue of uh, regionalisation through the PHNs and I'll come back to some of the challenges that that uh, will present for us because uh, I do think it presents some challenges but also pre presents some opportunities. As Ian said, regionalisation and localisation uh, should, if well governed, give the opportunity for uh, local control over services and programs. But I think importantly for rural areas, it also gives us a chance to possibly recorrect um, what the, in the jargon we, uh, we call geographic maldistribution of programs. And I'm sure you're familiar with the concept. The programs get rolled out at Commonwealth level and through various forces end up being pr principally delivered in metropolitan areas uh, predominantly. And so the regionalisation of funding through PHN, I think importantly, will give us a chance to correct some of that maldistribution. I understand, for instance, that uh, more than 50% of the mental health nurse incentive program is currently delivered in Victoria. So to have those funds uh, regrouped and uh, recouped and spent, uh, then redistributed out through PHNs to spend, we'll hopefully see some of those uh, issues correct, uh, corrected. I won't dwell on theft care or the online interventions that uh, Ian talked about. I do uh, also think Ian talked on the, the issue of clarifying Commonwealth roles and responsibilities and I think that there is an important breakthrough in terms of the Commonwealth taking uh, leadership on these uh, very important issues. Uh, the uh, Commission also recommended though that we manage the risks around uh, the transition to the NDIS and I think this is really the elephant in the room for us at the moment. Um, you know, we're about to go from a small number of thousands of people uh, engaged in the uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme uh, to hundreds of thousands of people over a very short space of time and I think the impact on uh, both the people and the service systems involved uh, is likely to be very, very substantial. Ian's also talked about the need to boost the mental health workforce and increase the capacity of uh, the NGO sector. So to finish with just a, a few reflections about where I think this, uh, where I think this leaves us. Uh, at the moment, uh, we have the sort of architecture laid, but I don't yet think we have the time frame and the plans laid out for reform. As I said, we're expecting the operational plans arising out of the NDIS uh, to be published soon. The government in its response to the National Mental Health Commission review said that it was going to provide funded organisations with certainty around their our contracted funding obligations this December. That leaves us about five working days. Uh, but that's going to be important in terms of giving people an idea about what happens next. Uh, who will have extensions of contracts? Who will have contracts that are slowly transitioned into the uh, either the NDIS or the PHNs? I think that's uh, very substantial. 
uh, and, and very important. Uh, how are these mental health reforms going to connect with other big reforms that are all in motion? Um, from where we sit in Canberra, it's very difficult to see the connections. I don't yet see the structures in place in government to, to bring those things together and I think that's going to be very challenging as uh, implementation rolls out uh, for those of us who play various sort of kinds of watchdog roles in reform. I think there's going to be a lot of money moving around. I think it's going to be very challenging for us to uh, watch that money and ensure that it's uh, appropriately spent. You will have seen in the MyEFO uh, there was an implied comment in the in the in the MyEFO that the government had cut 140 million dollars out of mental health services and programs uh, and was now spending that on a, on the ICE task force. Uh, it's not quite as simple as that uh, story presents. In fact, the money, the shifting of the money, is quite different. We have a, an explanation of that in the weekly update that uh, we'll put out, my organisation puts out each week. Uh, we'll have a, a, an explanation of how some of that uh, money is actually moving and shifting. But I think that will be an ongoing issue for us. Uh, I've already underscored, I think, uh, the, I think the special difficulty in ensuring that these uh, reforms uh, re relate well to the NDIS and ensure an integration of services and programs. Um, but also, you know, what is going to happen? What are the structural changes that we need, what are, the, what are the new governance arrangements, how are we going to ensure proper commissioning of programs and, and integration of services. There are some big questions that I think are, are yet to be answered uh, and I'll come to some more of those in, in a moment. Uh, I also think though that this fundamental notion, perhaps the biggest contribution from the NDIS, is this notion of individual choice and control and it's just very difficult for me to see uh, just as yet uh, exactly how individual choice and control is going to be preserved in an environment where literally hundreds of millions of dollars uh, are being shifted around the system and hundreds of millions of dollars of worth of programs and services are shifting from Commonwealth control to, to PHN control. Uh, I'll finish with some just some risks as I see them. Uh, as I said, the PHNs provide us with some real opportunities but I think for um, regional and remote communities in particular, there's a question of what does it really mean for a PHN to be local and, uh, and if your PHN is not local then what substructures are going to be required to ensure that PHNs are actually de delivering genuinely uh, local uh, programs. Are these PHNs going to sort of be trapped in their uh, medical prehistory? Are they going to uh, continue in the um, sort of manner of divisions of general practice or Medicare, even some of the Medicare locals and have a particularly medicalised uh, model or are we going to see the, the sort of expansion that we all hope for and that uh, Ian Hickey touched upon into a broader range of psychosocial supports and social and community services supports in the community. And what are the governance arrangements for the PHNs and are these, uh, are these uh, PHNs going to embrace uh, the sorts of organisations that you're involved with in their uh, governance structures and arrangements. As I said, what are the indicators and targets that are going to underpin this system and how are we going to ensure that the commissioning that we undertake over coming years actually achieves that sort of, um, uh, that, the, the sort of indicators and targets that, that we want to uh, achieve. Uh, I think it is a great opportunity. We end the year with uh, very substantial uh, reforms afoot. Uh, we've said in our office here that we're delighted really in a way that uh, it's, uh, we move out of reform mode now. Uh, uh, we can go away and have a break over Christmas and come back to um, uh, implementation mode in the new year and I think that's an exciting opportunity. As my slide now suggests, you know, many and, uh, uh, of the things that we've been doing previously are going to have to die and be left behind. Uh, and uh, many things are going to have to be pushed back into the water and resuscitated and I think we're going to have some challenging times ahead to work out uh, exactly how that uh, goes. But I, I do think that it's, uh, it's optimistic times. I do think we have an opportunity for very substantial uh, reform uh, if we embrace it. So thanks, thanks for the opportunity again from the uh, Health Alliance to um, uh, the Rural Health Alliance for us to participate in the workshop today. Hello everyone, I'm Russell Roberts. Um, thanks to uh, Frank, that's a great overview and also to Ian for going into more detail around this.
uh, Frank and Ian, uh, we'll probably have five minutes for questions at the end. So uh, if you look at the chat box, uh, we'll have a chance to discuss some of those. A number of people have asked for the slides will be available and yes, they will. Uh, firstly, I'm going to start with clock now. We've got 15 minutes and uh, um, I'm going to go at Northern Territory uh, speed limit uh, rate. Um, Firstly, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, our great land, and acknowledge the elders past and present. Um, also, I want to thank the National Rural Health Alliance for putting this on. It's fantastic. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm an adjunct associate professor at the uh, University of Sydney uh, School of uh, Rural Health at Project Hill. Um, and I think the reason I'm here, uh, I'm also the chair of the National Alliance for Rural and Remote Mental Health, and also chair the, the National Symposium for Rural and Remote Mental Health. I think I'm here to give a rural perspective. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, I've gone one too many. Um, I'll just go back a slide. Here we go. Sorry about that. Um, I've also had um, uh, 20 years' experience of, uh, in rural. Uh, 10 of those years uh, in Western, that, that green uh, box in Western New South Wales, uh, uh, managing mental health services right through from uh, 200 bed uh, acute tertiary statewide facilities. Uh, through to uh, towns like Mochi and, and Burke and also small towns like Wilcannia, so really across the entire gamut. Um, I've been on the implementation end of the Howard reforms, the Rudd reforms, the Gillard reforms, the Fourth Plan, and in New South Wales, the Myshima reform. Uh, so I think I'm here to give a sort of rural implementation perspective. Ian and, um, it's gone the wrong way, sorry. Ian and Frank have given a great uh, overview and a great summary of this, um, of, of the government response. Um, and so I'm not going to go over that, but I, I would like to take the opportunity to applaud the, applaud the National Mental Health Commission for their review um, in terms of the rural perspective. Firstly, they, they consulted widely and they listened. And I think because of that, essentially the, the commission's review of findings, the recommendations, are eminently sensible in the rural setting. So if you haven't read them, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend that you do so. Um, really, Ian's done a good job of summarising the government's response to the review, so I'm not going to go over that. Other than to say the rural recommendations, which is another document that I refer you to, is a summary of action. And, and those specific to rural, as the PHNs undertake comprehensive planning, they pull mental health funding, they develop and implement innovative models, um, and the notion of regional planning, service integration, and an emphasis on the digital gateway, basically telephone and internet based services. Um, I'm going to argue um, that whilst the response was uh, very solid, in fact, um, it, the major challenge of the Federation is what the federal government is doing is trying, um, it's the national tail trying to wag the federated dog. Um, and this is, this is one of the reasons why. Uh, when we look at the percentage of direct funding to mental health services, i.e. the stuff that people do stuff to other people, um, this is a breakout where about 60% is sort of essentially um, in the, funded by the states, and then there's a whack of uh, medication and a whack of private stuff through private uh, people like um, GPs, small businesses, small, uh, psychologists who have small businesses, and also private health services. And so their ability to have leverage is, uh, is challenging, quite frankly. This is another one from the Mental Health Review Data uh, Report itself. Um, and so while they spend $10 billion on uh, mental health services, $5 billion of that is for uh, disability support care, a billion is for uh, care of pay payments and, and alliances, um, uh, basically a billion is for Medicare, another billion for medication, uh, and then there's another billion for hospital, the ABS. And that's that bit with the Australian Government State Hospital. Uh, I understand that's probably the bit that's going to be trimmed, quite rightly so. But either way, whichever way you look at it, the majority of the blue and the green is not federal government. Um, so this is a real challenge. And I think the response is to wrestle with that. The other way of looking at well, how do you influence practice is you know, who's paying you, who's your boss? Well, let's have a look here. And, and, and in each of these disciplines or, or craft areas, um, you notice that the grey part of those bath fires are the um, uh, are that which is funded by the Commonwealth government. Um, sorry, like sorry, Russell. The majority for some GPs, they're small businesses, uh, and then some of the others. You can see that the state is the primary funder of this. 
So the response is actually trying to manage this uh, in, in that context. So um, Frank, if you move the slides, and, and the point that uh, Frank and I are making now is that <laughs> there's a number of uh, it, the states also have plans. And in fact, I think if we just go back to that last one, uh, Frank, <coughs> um, with the plans, um, four of those plans have actually been released in the last few weeks. And this is one of the vulnerabilities of the system. When the Victorian plan was released a couple of weeks ago, <coughs> the Victorian minister was then blaming the federal government for taking away the money. I presume Ian uh, alluded to this. I presume it's around the, the billion dollars in hospital funding. Um, so this is all relying on the states cooperating. So I think the duration of you and the, the, the states cooperating is very important. Next slide, please, Frank. Um, so not only do we have the states with their own plans, um, because it's local, we have the local health districts or the local health uh, networks. They also have their own plans and their own priorities as well. Um, and they often are there around the uh, emergency department KPIs, the budget tightening, the ABS uh, imperatives. Of course, we've also got other state agencies like Family Community Services, the Education Department, and Housing. Um, they also have their own plans and priorities. And finally, we also have the small businesses, i.e., the GPs. So this model is asking the PHN through their joint planning coordination to influence and wag this, broad, this huge dog of mental health intervention. Frank, could you control the next slide? Next slide. Um, so what is local? I think this is pretty obvious. You know, in uh, local in rural is very different to local in metro. So for example, in Perth, we'll go from Albany uh, to the south to um, to Broome. That's about 2,000 kilometres. And you go a bit further to Wyndham, it's probably closer to 2,500. So how are we going to do the local planning there? Where is the head office? Where is the governance? You can't do it all by digital. You've got to get out and meet with the community, see the context, speak with the elders, speak with the working parties to develop up plans that are flexible. And that's the case in every state. And even in my district, it took about 1,000 kilometres from side to side. And Western New South Wales compared to Western Queensland, South Australia, Northern Territory, and Western Australia is very small. Um, so local, how is this going to be governed across these areas? And it's going to require a bit of capacity. We have the next slide. slide thanks, Frank. Um, so what we're asking the PHNs to do is locally to negotiate this new model of funding, and I agree with the, with the model, it's fantastic, I agree with the elements, it's, it's great. Um, but they've really got to negotiate with the local health district with their priorities, the other government services, the NGOs who are partners, and GPs and other small businesses providing, like the psychologists providing care. And that all has to line up to get the coordinated care uh, and the policy outcome that we're after. Can we have the next slide, thanks Frank. Um, the other thing is, in the very process of this, there's a lot of charm and churn. For example, you open up these new services, new uh, federal government uh, funded services through the PHN, and they're lovely, they're innovative jobs, they're exciting, they're probably better paid, but in a limited workforce pool, who's going to be doing it? Well, it's the current mental health workers, often um, the clinicians, um, and, and also nationally there's a bit of churn. So if you have the next slide, uh, uh, Frank, they sort of dropped it. So um, in terms of Medicare Locals, in some of my consultations, people said, well, what's a Medicare Local? And they only found out just when they found out they were actually closing. So you know, over the last 20 years, we've had about 10 different plans. In fact, over the last six years, uh, sorry, for the last 10 years, we've had six plans. And we've got a fifth plan coming up uh, right uh, very soon. So that's one about every 19 months. So the sector is getting a little bit of reform fatigue. Um, in more ways than one. You just form up a service and then they close down with a new model. Now, some people might rightly be a bit sceptical about what's happening. And thanks, Frank. And so the manager in the middle, this is part of the churn, because often the manager who's, who's going to be managing this new PHN uh, approach is in fact a grown-up clinician. It's someone who's chosen a, a great clinician working in mental health services in the NGO sector or the public sector or private sector. And then they turn over to be a coordinator of services. And these are a very different set of skills. So whilst they were, they were trained, and you can see it on the slide there, clinicians have all this support and training. We move them into becoming middle managers. And they are the people locally on the ground that have to coordinate this and manage the relationship on a day by day, month by month, year by year basis. So we're really relying on this. And it's a system vulnerability, quite frankly, which would need to be addressed in rural settings. Next slide, thanks, Frank. Um, now, so with the churn, 
So who are running all these agencies, the other government agencies, the LHD components, etc.? Well, they're often new managers because they've moved across the PHN in terms of that workforce churn. So then we've got all these organisations and are they ready for change? So do they have the capacity to change? Do they have the change management competence? Are they ready for it? And finally, are they going to cooperate? Um, and so even if they are ready, you really need all four of those things uh, for this organisation to change. We know that change management is hard enough when you're the boss, when you're the director. But here we're trying to influence change in other organisations where the leaders are small. Thanks, Frank. I have to put you on a retainer. Um, now, it can work. I've had experience in a working 10 years uh, and it can work. And we did, I think, some great piece of work out in Burke with the Burke Human Services Accord. But it, it's almost precisely what's being advocated in this review. But we joined up services, we had the one care plan, we had the one client record, we joined up funding, became culturally competent, did all the local consultation planning, coordinated things, flexible funding package, brokerages, etc. And it worked to treat in a very high need environment. But it was a lot of work to set it up and a lot of work to maintain it. Um, and you know that was one of 50 odd communities in our local health district and you know most of the rural communities would have about that same number. Uh, next one, Frank. Also the work is actually quite complex and Jeff Fuller who I noticed is online, um, the department asked Jeff and, and some other authors including myself to do an international view of evidence, the best practice evidence of primary mental health care. And, um, and these are some of the things that have to happen, the enablers in order to have effective outcomes in primary mental health care. And you can see it on the slide there, the conditions have to have the right attributes in terms of being able to work up in a joined up fashion. You need a link to, to, uh, a linking, a staff linking enabler to bring these services together. But also you need to invest a lot of time in the clinical level partnership formation activities. And if possible have some infrastructure and evaluate that and the leadership. We've got the leadership, this is fantastic. I'm not too sure these other enablers exist and they're going to need a lot of support to develop them. Thanks, Frank. Um, so essentially what we're asking is that PHNs to lead a massive, a massive change management project over a massive area with a number of multiple communities, um, which you question whether or not you know, any organisation has this experience or expertise or capacity, yet they're doing it really with two hands tied behind the back because they don't influence the funding. The PH, as, as I argued at the, at the start, the PHNs only, will only have a very small amount of the total funding pool. Um, so it, it's possible, but it's going to require some support and implementation. Thanks, Frank. Um, just really quickly, and I've got two minutes left, and I can do it in two minutes. The single digital mental health gateway, great idea. Um, most states already have components of this already. I know South Australia pretty well has, New South Wales, I understand WA does. Um, so I think as Ian said, it's going to take a while to implement it. The other issue is it, it, it struggles to scale, scale up. We've been running this for about uh, eight years out in the West uh, and did look at scaling it up because it was working so well. But it does struggle to scale up when you're referring on to the, 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 service, the local services and in terms of the crisis response because to keep a track of all the services and the changes, and it's constantly changing, requires a lot of capacity, the back of house capacity. And just in our small area, 300,000 people you can see there, in a year we get about 20,000 calls, 2,000 assessments and 600 transports to uh, inpatient care. Um, so it's a great idea, it's going to need a bit of work scaling up and integrating with what the states already have in place. So thanks Frank for the next one. Um, so can we fix it? Yes, we can. Um, but really, we're going to have to ask, um, you know, Bob the Builder here is going to try and get the big, the, the big bulldozer states to sort of comply and get them going in the right direction. Also going to ask for the big excavator, private health uh, GPs and the small businesses to all cooperate and other state organisations to all cooperate uh, in order to go the right direction. We can do it, but it's going, it, there's a lot of system vulnerabilities. Thanks, Frank. In sum, if we go to the next slide, it's a great start. I think the policy direction is spot on. Implementation, the missing step needs a lot of work and using implementation land 
when you think about the change management of a project, double the stakeholders, double the complexities, and it's four times as hard as you ever expected. State cooperation, as Frank and Ian have mentioned, is critical. Getting the small businesses, i.e. GPs and psychologists, to cooperate is vital. My injunction and request is please consult um, those, uh, continue to consult around the implementation with the National Rural Health Alliance um, and also the National uh, Alliance Rural Remote Medicine. Please stop the short termism. Um, we let the system grow and develop and form before we start to reform it. And on my final slide, thanks. Um, is um, we invite you to join the discussion. Um, there's lots of opportunities to join the discussion, and uh, we invite you to all join. It. Um, we have the, an ad for the conference. Now the slides will be available. Um, but we have the Rural Remote Mental Health Conference in the sunny uh, Gold Coast uh, at the uh, end of next year. So please uh, contact the Secretariat there and the details are there to contact them. Uh, that's the end of my time. And now I think we're going to open it up to some uh, questions and comments, I think. Uh, and I don't want that slide, Frank. That was a spare in case someone asked you a question. So I think, Caroline, if we open up this for comments, uh, or of the questions that might have been raised. Um, Frank and Ian, we've got about uh, three or four minutes, I think, to finish this off. But there was a question about care and consumer co-design possibilities. It's, it's Frank. I'm happy to talk to that if, if you like, because uh, I think one of the things that's been uh, explicit in the National Mental Health Commission's review uh, the review talks about the engagement with uh, consumers and carers. It's, it's implied by the design model in any case if you're going to build a system that uh, builds around the needs of the individual. Um, but I don't frankly yet see the structures by which that will be achieved. So I think it's terribly important that uh, primary health networks, for instance, uh, have very active uh, consumer and carer uh, engagement for the purposes of co-design. Uh, but I think it's important that we build that into all levels of uh, system design and we'll have to face the fact, I think, that that will mean, I think, some structural support for consumer and carers to be organised, to build capacity and to engage in these huge reforms uh, on terms that are fair and reasonable. And, and Ian, there was another question I noticed talking uh, about organisations who want to start to tend to be part of this and, and where that information might be available or when it might come available because they're worried about the timeline to um, you know, join in on this, uh, in, on this reform. Uh, don't wait to be asked. I think at a local level you need to join these discussions locally. I mean the point you made, Russell, I think is a very important one. A lot of the capacity actually lies in local health districts. So I actually think if anyone's waiting for a top-down solution, an instruction booklet to arrive from the Commonwealth for how to join up or how to do whatever, it's never coming. In fact, you know, in a good or bad way, it's going to be a lot more chaotic than that. So in fact, I think one needs to build on local partnerships and leaderships. I think one of the issues is actually to bring new organisations into this. And I saw one of the comments about, and they may well be consumer or carer-led, they may be different kinds of organisations working with clinicians in different kinds of arrangements. I certainly won't be waiting for the local GPs and small businesses and local psychologists to determine what happens. That will be a waste of time. We need bigger, different organisations to enter into this reform process. So this is a serious sort of economic and structural reform. So it isn't health business as usual. But that would, you know, in a sense, so the innovative, the entrepreneurial, the proactive will probably benefit. Those who are waiting to be asked will not get to dance. You know, and I think this is where, coming back to your point, Russell, things like the Rural Health Alliance and others really need to take an active role in saying how they think it should be and then working with people who may want to, you know, bigger health providers, bigger welfare providers. Certainly that co-design with consumers and carers has never seriously been done. There's low-level consultation is still the order of the day. I don't want to be rude here, but we've met with a few PHNs who couldn't spell that, let alone understand what it was about, you know. It's not how health business actually traditionally actually runs. And this is not about GP divisions of general practice growing up. And on a conference I was on the other day just to really annoy me, what will GPs want? This is not about what will GPs want. This is about what do rural and regional communities need and what do the people experiencing these problems actually require? 
That's the guts of the NDIS reform, and it's that philosophy, despite all the implementation problems, which is now coming over into this area. I think, too, what I would want to say, Russell, is that uh, I think there would be a real danger if what we're heading to is a, um, a sort of very simplistic purchaser provider model that sees a whole lot of tenders uh, and a whole lot of uh, sort of traditional purchasing. I think this is an outstanding opportunity for us to do some much more sophisticated commissioning that uh, still engages, uh, uh, you know, in, ensures uh, competitiveness across the, the system, but actually sits down with uh, organisations uh, and plans services based on local assets and develops them. We've just produced a, a, a pre prepared a report on commissioning. Uh, which looks at some of the best practice internationally, and that's available on the Mental Health Australia website. And what that says is don't go for simple tender-based, outcome-based uh, tendering. Go for deeply uh, trusting relationships between purchaser and provider built on uh, mutual assets and respect and, and planned uh, and shared responsibility. And I think uh, if if we head down the tendering path, I think we're going to be in trouble. I think that's an important point, Frank. And I think many of the most innovative systems I've seen in Australia have come out of rural and regional Australia. They come out of smart local knowledge, smart local partnerships, mutual trust to create new things. I think this creates the structural reform, the financial reform, to get out of the top down, either from the Commonwealth through PHNs or the states through LHDs, to support that. Um, so what we'll be looking for, I think, is examples where people build on strong partnerships to then purchase that locally, not a simplistic tender, uh, you know, provider purchases kind of split run by the Commonwealth in some particular way. Um, but, I, but I think uh, people need to be proactive. People need to be thinking about what, what would really work. You know, what is it that we really need? And be proposing those new kind of partnerships that are not fundamentally just very health centric. Not just joining up your local GPs or joining up your local psychologists or getting them to work a slightly better with the nurses or something else or some slightly better partnership between the local state health services. This will also be quite different from state to state. So I think in those different plans, I think the point uh, Frank and Russell both highlighted, for example, it's my view that New South Wales is up for it. I've got no idea whether Victoria is really up for it. You know, they quite like what they already do and they're not sure they're really up for it. Queensland and WA, I think, are giving serious consideration to, you know, we, this is the kind of thing we want to do. And new tools like mapping services, mapping the flows, you know, understanding the community in terms of not just the community need but the service provision landscape are part of this kind of framework. But I strongly encourage, and I suspect a lot of people are on this particular webinar, those who are proactive and have knowledge to start thinking about what those service organisations look like what new ones might we get in that might be more digitally based or they might include bigger health providers from the private or welfare sector, new sort of partnerships, not just a reorganisation of the existing classic MBS and state funded systems. They haven't worked and the request to pour more and more money into those systems for poor outcomes. You know, that's what's led to those plethora of reports that I think Russell was chucking around there, inquiries, reports, reforms, which all go back to the same structures. And you know, they don't really change the landscape, particularly they don't change the options in rural and regional Australia. And I think what we don't want to see is a top-down, uh, Commonwealth top-down approach or state government top-down approach replaced with a PHN top-down approach. I, I think we need to see something much more engaged. Yes, yeah, so I think it's fair to say, Frank, I mean, I'm pretty enthusiastic about it, but I think the mental health sector more generally has expressed a great deal of scepticism about the PHN's capacity to actually deal with mental health seriously. You know, and I, I think that scepticism has a legitimate basis. And that's going to, I'm going to say from the National Commission point of view ongoing, is to monitor this, but also support those who are doing it well. Because I think, yeah. some, as I say, some of the best examples of integration I think we have seen in regional and rural Australia, where smart people have run those systems over a, a significant period of time. I take Russell's point, there needs to be some continuity in management for that to actually happen. Um, I think we're out of time, and I think that's a great um, um, note to finish on. The notes that uh, you know, rural has, and I've noticed some comments from Tasmania, and certainly in Tasmania and Northern Territory, there's some magnificent examples of innovation, and rural does have a uh, magnificent um, 
examples of innovation and this is an opportunity whether you work in uh, LHD land or for other government agencies or, or NGOs, it is an opportunity to, as Ian said and Frank said, take the initiative to do something that I think is really creative and be able to do work in a much better way for better outcomes for people. I, I just want to thank my fellow presenters, uh, Ian Hickey and Frank Quinlan. It's been fantastic, it's been an honour to present with you. Um, but also particularly to uh, thank the Rural Health Alliance for putting this on. Um, thank you for your leadership and your contribution to mental health and its role in the general health and uh, community. Um, but also thank you to all the people who, and the hundreds and hundreds of people who registered and participated in this webinar. Uh, thank you for your interest and, and being engaged with this and then for your good work. Um, we would like to finish up now on behalf of the, the National Rural Health Alliance, wish you a safe and happy Christmas and wish you good boy, goodbye and uh, safe Christmas. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks everyone, thank you. Thank you Ian, Frank and Russell for your presentation and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. We wish you a pleasant afternoon.